Hi, we're Fifth Harmony, the seasoned investment team at Mosaic Capital Partners. We'll be considering a joint venture partnership investment with 512 Development Partners in Northern Lakewood. I'm Andrew Karras. I'll give you a brief overview of the investment opportunity. Then Lauren Black will zoom out and provide some context for the investment. Next, Alex Gary will walk you through some of the numbers that drive our conclusions before Margot Sumant and it analyzes some of the alternative scenarios that could affect our bottom line. Finally, Leah Moe will wrap it all up and present our final recommendation. It isn't every day that an investment opportunity on this scale in a neighborhood this hot with this much value add potential comes across our desks, and that's exactly what 512 has presented us with. We're talking about 1,000 units across four legacy buildings in a neighborhood uh, whose economics are fundamentally very strong. Historically, rent growth in Northern Lakewood has been above the national average, and occupancy at about 95% has been very strong. These trends have been especially true after the great financial crisis, and we'll talk in a moment about uh, the, our level of confidence in their continuation. To the extent that we have any concern uh, with this investment on the front end, it's in setting up that joint venture agreement. With a 50-50 equity contribution split, we're entering somewhat of uncharted territories for Mosaic, because Mosaic is a little bit more familiar with joint venture agreements uh, where we contribute more of the capital and thus retain greater level of control over execution. That said, from a portfolio diversification standpoint, it benefits us to deploy only one-sixth of our uh, remaining fund equity into this single project. From a timeline perspective, we expect to be able to sell and exit the investment uh, well within our fund, fund lifespan, although we have about a year of uh, extendable cushion before we would potentially have to refinance our loan. The return we've modeled for Mosaic, 12.1% IRR is our core, our central estimate. It's right within our, our fund target band. The, the LTV uh, allows us, uh, we could go up to 70%, level up, or lever up a little bit higher than the target, thanks to prior fund investments and below target uh, LTV. So when we think about what we really like about this project, the strengths, as I mentioned, uh, begin with the economics. The strong rental growth, or strong rent growth, strong occupancy, give us confidence that the upside is potentially huge. In addition to offering market rate rentals, we will be signing, uh, or we propose to sign an affordable housing agreement with the city, whereby we will rent some of our units at below market rents in exchange for a 40-year abatement against the tax expenses on this property. On top of that, about 40% of our rental income derives from rental, renters holding publicly subsidized vouchers. Those tenants pay market rents while exhibiting uh, rock bottom turnover rates about 3.5%. These three income streams help us balance, on the one hand, the strength and, and growth of our revenue streams, as well as their stability. And it's all possible because of a robust capital investment program that builds upon 60 million in uh, capital improvements under the prior, uh, the prior owner during the last five years. To the extent that we believe Mosaic is stretching to pull off this opportunity, again, it goes back to the joint venture. But we believe by smartly structuring the waterfall and putting in clauses into the contract, such as a right of first refusal and, uh, well, right of first refusal um, and dragging rights, we will be able to avoid entering uh, arbitrage, I'm, I'm sorry, avoid arbitration uh, and unlock synergy between us and our partner. The opportunity should rental growth exceed our estimate is enormous, and one uh, factor that we believe will bolster demand is a potential hospital expansion, which, if it happens, will not only consume some of the remaining and increasingly scarce developable land in Northern Lakewood, it will also attract residents, workers, visitors, and corporate uh, corporate clients, or corporate uh, executives coming into town uh, and in directly into Northern Lakewood. Of course, if rents can exceed expectations, they can also disappoint. And so we've made sure to model sensitivities 
of both uh, cyclical contingencies. Finally, the political risk associated with a gentrifying neighborhood is considerable, and so we believe inking this affordable deal now locks in a deal we can live with as a hedge against uncertainty as the city works out ways to respond to voters concerned about rising rents. Lauren? Thank you. Before we dive into the analysis of our investment, I'd like to explain to the committee the background and the catalyst for this transaction. Urbanization continues to be a major trend nationwide, and large metropolitan areas are experiencing above average economic growth. Within the northern Lakewood market, housing, demand for housing remains robust. As you can see here, short run rent growth is quite volatile, and the cycle may be nearing its peak. However, we believe that there is still opportunity here. Long run rent growth continues to average between four and 5%. Further, affordable housing is scarce and construction is cost prohibitive. Innovations in the rental market are attempting to address affordability concerns. We evaluated a spectrum of solutions uh, with respect to our proposal from big data to co-living. We evaluated these solutions on a feasibility scale from low to high, as well as evaluating these solutions with respect to uh, making, addressing tenants' affordability concerns, again, on a scale from low to high. For example, modular construction could reduce building costs, and those costs could be passed down to the tenants in the form of reduced rent. However, this solution is not feasible in our case, as we are working with an existing structure. On the other hand, flexible full-service rentals offer a balanced approach, allowing us to extract market rate rents while providing space for the affordable housing part of our proposal to work. Public and private solutions are attempting to mitigate the effects of the affordable housing crisis. First, government interventions, like the end to single family zoning in Minneapolis, push developers to build denser multifamily buildings. Second, private initiatives, like company-sponsored housing in Palo Alto, subsidize the cost of living for employees in market areas where the rent is quite high. And lastly, public and private partnerships, like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, attempt to incentivize developers to build housing for low and moderate income individuals and families. We believe that this investment presents a win-win opportunity for Northern Lakewood. For the community, our plan supports income integration in a city with restrictive zoning, limited developable land, high rent prices, and a housing shortage. Our plan creates 667 units of affordable housing in an area with good public schools and access to public transit. And our plan contributes to reducing carbon emissions, creating a healthier and cleaner environment for the community. For our investors, our, proper, our plan decreases property taxes from 20% to 3% over a 40-year period. Our plan generates an ongoing source of income throughout the hold period due to the historically low turnover rates for market rate and for public voucher units. And our plan achieves market rent premiums on our recently upgraded units. In the midst of this affordable housing crisis, our proposal sets an example for multifamily investments nationwide by expanding access to affordable housing while continuing to provide robust returns for our investors. And now Alex will explain the analysis behind our proposal. I'd like to walk you through the model that we created for this investment opportunity. You'll see in the graph on the left, NOI is steadily increasing over time, in about the mid-20s. You'll see that this might not really make sense, though, when you're considering an affordable housing opportunity. But there's two reasons for this. One, there's a very slow turnover rate in the units that we have. And two, the premium rents that we can charge on those units that have yet to be turned over. Through this process, we're able to sustain the affordability piece and slowly work towards that two-thirds requirement over a long run. Here's our cash flow su summary. Looking through how we have an initial cap rate of 
and we'll be exiting at a 4.75 cap rate. So the value of this opportunity, it's in the sale. We're able to achieve this cap rate compression through the heavy upfront capital on projects like the energy efficiency project, like the cogeneration, and the submetering utility improvements, where those will lead to long run ROI. We'll be cash flow positive in year 2022 and be able to sell in year 2024 at that 4.75 cap rate, paying off the rest of our debt. This is a great opportunity for Mosaic. It's a bit different, though, than what we're used to because of this equity split. So we have to think about how we're going to structure this deal. When you're looking at it, 512 brought this opportunity to us. And they're the ones that are going to be executing it on the day to day. And we need to structure it accordingly. Within the funds context, too, we have a five year hold that meets the requirements. We have the 12.1 percent IRR that meets the fund requirements, and we have the 1.74 equity multiple that also meets the fund requirements. Within this JV structure partnership with 512, we're dividing the upside and the downside risks. 512 Development Partners, their bread and butter is in affordable housing, and that's where they're really going to shine in this. However, they don't have as much experience in those premium rental units that we'll be converting. So, that's where we're going to come in. And that's where we're going to advise them on how to position those assets to best take advantage of this opportunity. As I talked about, 512, they're going to be the ones that are executing on the day to day. But we'll still have meetings frequently to maintain that alignment throughout the entire project. We need to consider, too, the strict capital budgeting requirements and the pre specified amounts that we've had conversations with about this project in addition to the right to veto any major decisions throughout this project. We can specify all of these within the contract, but really the way to motivate 512's upside, because they're operating on the day-to-day, -day -day, is going to be through the waterfall structure that we've, we have here. You'll see that with this 50-50 equity split, it starts out pretty even. However, as you continue and move down the tier and increase that IRR, 512 is going to get an increasing portion all the way up to 85%. And that's why we want to incentivize their upside by motivating them to go in day in, day out, and perform. We'll have Margot talk about the sensitivities. So Alex just walked us through the performa. I'll walk you through the sensitivity analysis that we ran and how they impact our returns. Uh, as you can see on this slide, we consider two significant components. First, whether or not to continue with the cogeneration um, improvements. It's a 7.5 million upfront capital investment. Um, however, we saw that with the energy savings and the tax credit, we can actually improve returns and increase our IR. So our recommendation is to go forward with those improvements. Second, we wanted to test a scenario where we do not go with the affordable agreement. The rationale is that we could boost uh, rent, gr uh, gross rent income, um, exit at a lower cap rate, and maximize the, the value of the renovations. However, from the IR, you could see that we're nowhere near our target, targeted returns. In fact, the value of this deal is really the property tax abatement, and that's how we can make this investment possible. Um, this is the financial, aside from the financial implications, um, it would create misalignments with our operating partner whose bread and butter is really uh, workforce and affordable housing. We also considered different uh, financing options. We were given quotes for three different uh, loan types of different LTVs and interest rates. Um, we recommend going with the higher levered option at 70% LTV um, to, target the, to target the returns that uh, our fund needs. And then finally, we wanted to test the assumptions regarding grant growth. Currently, our rent growth are ba is based on the rolling averages that Lauren presented us earlier, so around 2%. But we want to consider an economic downturn and where we could ha have major negative impacts on, income, on incomes in the area. To do so, we decreased the, the rent growth by 100 basis points just to see what, uh, what would happen to our returns. As you can see, we're at 10.5%. So this is a risk we have to consider, but we're really confident in, the, in this property and this market 
It's um, limited competition in a gentrifying neighborhood. So we could actually see upside, especially with a hospital expansion and we have, shop, we have increased employment growth. In this scenario, where we increase the rent growth by 100, 100 basis points, we see that our returns are in the high teens, further motivating our operating partner. Um, ultimately, we are confident in the assumptions that we have in this model, and Leah will walk you through some of those implications. Thanks, Margo. As Margo alluded to earlier, there are some potential risks in this investment, and that's in the case of an economic downturn. While we do not think it's likely, we do want to call out three major factors that could pot potentially um, risk our investment targets. First, it's in the rent growth rates. Second, it's in our cap rate. And lastly, it's in our cost escalations. We're currently predicting a strong rental growth rate year by year because we're in a supply constraint market. However, in the event of an economic downturn and an influx of inventory, we could see the rent growth decline or even stagnate, which would decrease our investment returns over the long run. Second, in terms of cap rate, we're predicting a lower go exit cap rate than a going in cap rate. However, with government regulations like rent controls, this could decrease the sale price and increase our cap rate, thereby decreasing the attractiveness of this investment portfolio. The last risk to consider is with cost escalations. Currently, based on the case, we have minimal to none renovation costs, escalations, as well as capital improvement escalations. We could see in the market with increasing labor costs as well as material costs, that our cost escalations for capital improvements will actually increase and therefore also decrease the attractiveness and return of our investment portfolio. However, we believe that the positives outweigh the negatives in this investment, and we believe that in the short run, we will receive a positive return and, invest and hit our investment targets. And this is why Mosaic Capital should partner with 512 to invest in this Northern Lakewood property because of a 12.1% IRR, as well as a 1.74 times equity multiple that is in line with Mosaic's um, target returns. We believe the deal is unique because of the 50-50 equity contribution split between the operator as well as Mosaic. This demonstrates that 512 has a strong conviction in this investment, as well as the fact that Mosaic will have a diversified portfolio with a lower risk in this investment as they're only putting 50%. Second, we believe the rationale for this deal truly lies in the property tax abatement incentive. This not only provides an economic benefit for Mosaic, but also Mosaic is in, in, in return able to provide a social benefit for the local community by generating two thirds of its units as affordable housing. In addition, there is gonna be an expansion of hospitals in this area. And the opportunity for this expansion of hospital means a growing demand for visitors, hospital visitors. And thereby, we propose that we create the rest of the one third of its units as short term luxury apartments. This will allow us to increase our rent rates as well as increase the IRR returns. And we believe there's a demand for this in this market because of the visitors who are going to be visiting the hospital as well as existing corporate employees who are traveling into the city and need short-term luxury accommodations. Therefore, our investment team believes this is a strong investment and a smart way to do affordable housing. Thank you so much for your time today, and we'll now open it up to any questions. I think, I think for us, the most important thing that we'll not compromise on is in the affordable housing. We we'll want to meet the affordable housing um, uh, agreements because as Margot pre previously um, showed us that we will be able to generate positive return as well as the fact that we think this is going to be providing a social benefit for a community that has extremely high rental rates and so we want to provide affordability in this market. And I, I think the waterfall structure, I think that's really where we're going to make sure we're incentivized and that they're going to complete the project and execute um, on time and within budget. Um, so ultimately, sticking to those um, percentages, I think, is will allow us to uh, come to an agreement. Yeah. So in looking at the and looking at the case, and also looking at short-term rental markets in, in the um, general market in the U.S., we found that generally the market rates for short-term rentals are between four thousand to six thousand per month. And we budgeted that into our model and considered the fact that there's going to be higher vacancy, vacancy rates, given that it's more short-term stay, as well as the fact that we're going to have to put in higher um, capital improvements. 
And so at around a conservative $4,000 um, per month rent, we're estimating a 20% IR return. Sure, I, I, I can address that. So we mentioned um, clauses in the contract that affect the sale. But I think you're mentioning um, things that would happen prior to a sale. Either the execution doesn't work out or they don't contribute the capital. So to the second point, um, we have a couple different options. If you, uh, you know, look at the literature around you know, the legal case history of, of these contracts, one thing to do uh, would be to essentially charge effectively an interest on any capital that 512 does not contribute. Again, since we're only uh, contributing one-sixth of our remaining deployable equity, we, we have some more funds that we could put in to salvage the project at significant cost to us. And so I, I think that interest is justified. And as we enter a negotiation, a ne negotiating, negotiation with 512, I think our, our stance as a, a reputation as a very strong capital partner gives us a lot of bargaining power. Yeah. The way that we, we want the right to veto major decisions throughout this project. And so we'd be able to structure those out throughout the, throughout the contract, so it's not really vetoing anything. We want to give them the ability to execute on the day-to-day -day decisions, and we trust them um, through those types of decisions. But these types of major decisions would be pre-outlined within the mm -hmm. contract, and they, they'd agree to that. Or that, that's how we would propose the deal. Yes, I think I think in line with what the case had said, it would be a co we'd be cooperating, and so and we'd be making decisions collective. T together as equal partners, so we would give them equally veto rights as well. Well, yeah. in the event of a sale, um, and we did a little bit of research during the break, so if you'll give me a moment, um, we certainly want to put in a, a right of first offer clause. Um, so that the way I understand it, I think if we find someone who's willing to buy, 512 is forced to sell to us unless they can find a more compelling offer. That's one way to do it. Um, otherwise, we can institute drag-along rights where they would be forced uh, to go along with whatever we decide. Um, obviously, that plays into the negotiation, but I think that's what the promote is for. They get a, a higher IRR than us in, in the base case, and I think that's their, part of their role as a developer. Sure, that's a discussion we can have. Um, of course, if you go much below 70, um, I think Mario can talk about this, or we could go back to that slide for the specifics, but it pushes our IRR down. There's probably, <clears throat> I'm sorry, right, there's, there's a number somewhere between 65 and 70, it's sort of a minimum for us. Um, although, if, you know, if there's a give and take, we can find other ways to make up that IRR. Yeah, we had an acquisition fee um, of a uh, uh, half a percent, since it's a, such a large deal. I uh, don't think a percent is appropriate, and an ima operating management fee. So they're they're definitely we're we're giving the incentive to for them to 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 execute on time and deliver a good project. I think the idea is really leveraging their expertise within this overall context. Like we talked about, their bread and butter is within this affordability opportunity, and so giving them the opportunity to shine through their expertise. That's where we see them really contributing the value. And while we will provide them with the asset management fee, this is really the way to, to structure it so that they're, we're able to align, I think, both of our incentives for Mosaic to meet the, the fund's IRR requirements while incentivizing 512 to perform as best as they can on the day-to-day -day because of their, their really strong upside. And just to call one additional thing out, you know, I, I know you can see it, but the hurdles are 10 and then 12, 14, and the fund five uh, sort of target IRR band is between 12 and 14. So that's where it really starts to uh, tilt in their favor once we hit 12. Right. And the reason why we have it more, of a, um, more in favor of 512 is because Mosaic is putting in a 50% equity contribution. Usually the contribution from the LP side is between the ranges of 70 to 90. So Mosaic is putting in a lower initial contribution, so we think it's fair to give 512 a higher return once it hits our um, IRR targets. 
Yeah, we, yeah we, would, we would do the deal, and that's because in our model with the 12.1% IR, that has not modeled out the increase in rent from luxury apartments yet. So when we model out the increase in rent from luxury apartments to so around a conservative $4,000 um, per month cost, we'll actually see over 20% IR. So yes, we would still do the deal without, without that opportunity. We just think that with luxury short-term apartments, the, the pot upside potential and return for this investment could be even larger than, than what we present here to this committee today. All right, thank you to Fifth Harmony. Yeah.